So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all viewers from all around the world. Welcome to the Humanizing Growth series, brought to you by the Institute for Real Growth, aka IRG. Um, at IRG, it's our purpose to connect marketing and other growth leaders to help them humanize business growth by connecting them to thought leadership, to experts and to peers. And that's exactly what we also want to do in this webinar. My name is Frank van den Driest. Uh, I'm co-founder at IRG and I'm particularly pleased to announce not one, but two guests for this session, Jody Harris and Miguel Patricio. In the next hour, I will talk with Jody and Miguel about leadership, about creating a marketing culture and build the capability to nurture the top talent to become the future leaders. And about a personal journey, a remarkable journey of, uh, of climbing the ranks all the way from a local marketing manager to that of a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. So welcome Jody and welcome Miguel. Jody, let me start with you. Um, you started your career as a market researcher or insights manager as we now like to call that. Um, and to me, that's a pretty good indication of what's probably your level of curiosity. And, and, and like me, um, you'll, been intrigued by what's happened uh, in the past uh, couple of months since C19 hit us. So, so let me ask you this, over those three months, what do you, what was for you the biggest insight, the biggest learning that, that, that you came upon in those, in those last months? It's a very big question, Frank. Um, but first, hi, wonder. Frank. <laughs> I just want to first just hi Frank. Hi everybody on the call. Um, it's really great to be here uh, today, even though we're, we're all at a distance um, and with my former boss, Miguel. Um, we're all doing well here, my family, my team. We're managing through this new remote routine um, and really focusing on pushing through to get to the other side of this. And so the one thing that I've learned, I think is the, um, uh, the incredible our own strength, our own resilience as, as human beings. I think it's very easy to, um, you know, step inside ourselves and feel helpless, uh, which at times we do. That's part of being a human as well. Um, but really, you know, seeing the silver lining and taking this opportunity to, to do things we've never done before and to champion and help people in need. So I think, you know, there's a bit of curiosity, um, but also will. That's, uh, that's really emerging, which is really beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Um, Miguel, a, a few will argue that, that a crisis is typically the accelerator of change and of trends that we were already seeing. Now there's one particular trend, or I would almost call it a shift, that as the Institute for Real Growth, we are very closely monitoring. And that's the shift from, let's say, the, uh, the Milton Friedman days with his adage of, let me read, there's one and only one social responsibility for business, and that's to engage in activities to design to increase the profits for shareholders, period. And we're shifting to the thing that like Michael Porter called shared value, or that at the IRG we call real growth, which is much more about long-term value creation for all the stakeholders, not only the shareholders. How do you see, do you recognize the shift? Uh, how, how do you see this and what do you think of it? Well, I absolutely recognize that shift, uh, uh, Frank. And um, right now, my number one concern is, is with the safety of, of, our, of our teams. And I mean it, you know, we are, a, one of the industries in food that becomes absolutely indispensable at this time. And, and we have 80 factories around the world. And, and from the beginning of this crisis, uh, our number one uh, responsibility or our number one concern has, has been with them. And, and I'm very glad uh, to say that uh, 
morale in our factories, in our people have never been so high because they feel that, first they feel that with a big sense of purpose, but second, because the company has put their safety ahead of everything else. At the same time, we started connecting with communities. We made a donation of $12 million basically to food banks around the world, and we keep increasing this number. Um, and uh, so I think it's, it's a moment really, really to, to connect with the world much more than financially speaking. And I'll give you an example. We just announced our quarter uh, results. I didn't talk to the media. I, I, I thought that was less important the financial results. I think the most important is, is our people and our consumers. Um, I think in a moment like this, of course, financial results are important, but, but this is just a consequence. It's not what are we really looking at. No, it's, it's nice. It's, it's interesting, and, and maybe we've talked about it in the past, but I, I always like to, it's a little hobby of me, to, to track um, uh, investor calls and so on, and, 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 and big town halls of CEOs, and then just basically turf or count the number of times that that money and, and profit and turnover are being referenced versus employees, consumers, or the communities that you operate in. And, and that's exactly where you're talking about, that, that, that you made a big shift there. Um, that's, that's, I think, undoubtedly, and I know from some of the viewers, um, the context in which you operate, uh, one of your big shareholders is uh, 3G, uh, the investment firm that, that's also uh, known uh, for very successfully uh, managing costs, introducing zero-based budgeting, and having a brutal focus on, on, on delivery uh, of, the, uh, of results, of financial results. So, and that sounds very, that sounds uh, as opposite to, to what we just talked about multi-stakeholder, long-term growth. How do you see, what, what's the response? What's the conversation you're having with, with your shareholders on this? Well, you know, uh, um, I think that first there's a misunderstanding about what CBB is about. CBB uh, is not about cost cutting. And the ones that look at CBB as cost cutting, they had problems in the, in, not in the long term, in the midterm. And by the way, Kraft Heisman was one of them. Um, before. The, they used ZBB to just to cut and cut and cut. And at a certain moment, if you cut too much cost, your costs start increasing, which is what happened. For me, ZBB is, is about efficiency. It's about doing things every day better. And if you really think about efficiency, the consequence of efficiency is cost reduction um, because you are doing things better every day. Um, and that is, you know, really based on the, the principles of ownership, right? What we want is every single employee to look at the company as if the company was owned by them and to take the best decisions for the business. Again, um, ZBB is not about cost cutting. ZBB is about uh, efficiency. And, and that's the best way to invest best back in, in brands. If you have a, a very efficient business, then you can invest back on your brands, on, on your consumers. And that, that's what I'm pursuing at this moment. Clear, clear, fair enough. Um, Jody, um, you're on mute. Um, so we need to go off mute in, in a second. But uh, so we talk about uh, the philosophy around growth and the role of the corporation. So to what extent does the definition of growth and we, 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 talk, we talk about real growth being, as I said, long-term, multi-stakeholder oriented. To what extent does the definition of growth determine the culture and the culture program that you lead at, uh, at ABI? Yeah, it's, um, you know, at ABI, we, we often say that it takes the same amount of energy to dream big as it does to dream small. So why not dream big? That's a nice one. <laughs> and... Um, uh, I think like, like many companies, there's always been an obsession to be number one, right? Number one in market share, uh, number one in preference. Um, well, then that behavior uh, is what drives, um, you know, perhaps maybe marginal growth, especially in stagnant categories. And um, unfortunately, you know, beer being, being one, 
uh, recent. But you know, oftentimes this leads to behaviors that are, are risk averse, are short term oriented, safe, um, and bureaucracy. Right, and this is one of the things that we constantly fight each day as, as a large CPG company. But when you set a trajectory that's, that's on leading growth of a category, of an industry, that starts to set a different tone and pace, particularly with your people. And it all starts with your people, right? Understanding their needs. So for me, as, as head of culture and capabilities and marketing, uh, my consumer, my customer are our colleagues, right, at the end of the day. And so we need to make sure we build those capabilities to grow and there's a few things we've learned um, in a very short period of time yeah. um, along the way. And, you know, first it's about operating with a growth mindset and, and making sure that we have the infrastructure that, that follows that, right? So what does the team need? What resources do we need to, to either acquire or build to provide them to help them grow? Um, how can we address and remove their barriers uh, and, and, and knock down those barriers that slow us down, right? Just like we would as we were building any brand program and addressing consumer and human truths. Um, the second is really around attracting and, and engaging strong talent as well as our partners. And right? our partners are just as equally as important in the mix here and they need to be focused on growth and growing together. So that sense of collaboration and creating an environment where people feel empowered, feel heard and where creativity in particular can thrive and also be recognized and rewarded because that drives that momentum. And then I think lastly is, is really about being obsessed about the consumer, right? Um, or about people at the end of the day. So innovating our portfolio, um, building internal systems, uh, which really means deeply understanding people and their needs and addressing them faster than anybody else can. And um, someone once uh, said to me, someone I admire who might be on this call, uh, that the opposite of empathy is arrogance. That was the word, <laughs> arrogance. Uh, and if you don't open your mind to different perspectives, you're not going to learn, right? And, and learning equals growth. And so we've, we've really cultivated a, a culture, particularly within the marketing organization, because we believe that's, that we're the gatekeepers to the consumer, to the outside world, um, to, to do exactly that, right? Upskilling our people, creating a culture of creativity and innovation, and then making sure that our, our folks feel empowered and, and engaged to, to do that. So just, just on that, uh, Jody, um, we talked about, so my question was really about the shift, right? From, from, from the Friedman focus, short-term maximum profit delivery to long-term. Does that shift impact your programs? It does that impact the way you hire? Does it impact what you teach people, how you nurture leaders? It does. It absolutely does. In fact, you know, we're, we're seeing this come to life um, with the very notion of what it means to be essential and non-essential, right? And so what that, what that means for companies and brands and um, companies that have this growth mindset and the people that bring that growth mindset are, are starting to reinvent themselves, right? So, you know, I'm working on programs related to hand sanitizers and masks that I never thought <laughs> I would have to tap into that, um, tap into that area. Um, and then how do, I, how do I teach my folks, you know, 1,500 marketers around the world to, to be open to thinking differently, to prioritize differently, um, to, uh, to want to learn? One, one example I can give is we've partnered with an, an external company uh, for a digital transformation learning program. And we launched it just ahead of, of COVID. And uh, I, I didn't think that, you know, 1,500 people would go online and take a diagnostic and want to, you know, look at modules on how to build social media plans, et cetera. And they did. Uh, I think we're at 1,200 <laughs> who have actually logged on and it's, it's a lifeline for them. And so, but it's about being, you know, quick, and dare I use the word agile um, and adaptable to really understand their needs and shift to meet their needs, whether it's internal or external. Jody, uh, before I go to Miguel uh, for my next question, I just uh, want to comment that uh, actually one of the viewers who also happens to be on our uh, uh, RG 100 leadership program that you're on as well, um, but he's in a different cohort, I believe, Dawa Bergma. And um, uh, he, he is, he's now the CMO of a, of a large uh, hospital chain. 
and he is thanking you uh, for the hand sanitizers that uh, Piedmont uh, are actually using, uh, delivered by ABI. So good. By the way, um, to all the viewers, uh, in about uh, in, in a couple of minutes, we'll start opening the floor for questions that you might have to Jody or to Miguel. Uh, but before we go there, Miguel, we announced that today's topics is leadership, and. Uh, how do you, I mean, it's a bit of an open question, but how do you see yourself as a leader? Because I'm asking, because I'm absolutely convinced that, that at least half the viewers, I mean, the tra trajectory that you made, um, climbing all the ranks in marketing, becoming the CMO of the largest beer company, extremely successful company, and now being the CEO of the Kraft Heinz uh, Group is something that's, uh, yeah, super inspiring to, 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 to our viewers and to many CMOs that, that I know. Um, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. How do you see yourself as a leader and, uh, and, 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 and what's, what, what's, your, what's been your secret sauce? What's your recipe for, for your trajectory? Frank, it's hard to talk about ourselves as leaders, but I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to answer that uh, with the second part of your question, which, um, which is probably related to the fact that we don't have, uh, uh, unfortunately, too many CEOs around the world that came from the marketing uh, part of the business. And um, I, I don't know why. I think that... Uh, the first, uh, the first thing you need, of course, is the ambition um, uh, to to be. Um, but uh, on top of the ambition, is is really, uh, you know, thinking about marketing as a part of the business, and really being, uh, you know, business driven. Before becoming CMO, I was uh, the head of two very important zones, uh, North America and Asia Pacific, and that. And before that, I was all in marketing. So I had had before that experience marketing many different companies, including ABI. Um, but I wanted to go to manage a, a business and to manage a zone. Um, and, and, and that gave me the experience uh, to manage big business and, and qualify me to become a CEO one day. I think CMOs that become CEOs um, in consumer goods, is a must because marketing is the part of the company that really thinks and understands the future um, that uh, needs to set and to drive the strategy of the company. And that is a big part of the work of a CEO um, um, uh, in a CPT, in a consumer goods company. So, so it should be the natural path for that. Um, so that, that, you know, at, at, even at ABI for a long time, I was, the only person with a marketing background in the, in the leadership team. Today, half of the leadership team members all are from marketing. And I think this has been an evolution uh, uh, there as well. Um, That's interesting. So, so during your, your stint at ABI, so was it that you, how do you, how do you say it in, in English, flattened the path or... Um, gave the were the role model for, for the board to see you know actually we need more marketers in in our uh, in our board or was it more that you inspired more marketers to go it must be a big step from being a marketing to running a zone in, in ABI. I mean that, that these are huge PLs. Um, yeah so you know I'll give you examples but, um, yeah. um, I think we're both I think we're, was both. Uh, I inspired the the board, and I inspired my people to have the ambition and to to get there. Today, the 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 leader of the biggest zone, which is Latin America, it was a person reporting to me. I'm, I'm managing global brands. The head of Europe was the head of innovation. The head of Africa was the head of marketing for Latin America. Um, uh, so all coming from marketing, and, and, and even if you go to the to one one step down, um, you know we have many presidents of countries that were from marketing. So the head of UK is a lady, and she was my head of insights one day, um, then became the head of uh, marketing for Brazil, and today is the head of U UK. And you have many examples like that. And I think it has been an evolution 
of the company. You know, I'll give you another sign of that, that I like a lot and feel very proud of. Um, 10 years ago, we were afraid of creativity. Uh, ABI was a very, very um, efficient company, but being efficient was just the opposite of, of being creative because to be creative, you have to take risks and, and we were risk averse. And, and we started a big, big program on, on creativity seven years ago. Uh, and I think that we made huge progress in the company. Um, and I think that helped a lot. And, and today, you know, there's all this, this uh, I think, in my opinion, a misunderstanding about, about our culture. But the truth is that uh, uh, in accordance to Can, the number one company in creativity in the world is Burger King in, in communication. And the number three is ABI. Um, and the number two is Nike, by the way. Um, this did, didn't happen from a day to another one. Five years ago, ABI was not even in their rankings. Now, my next battle on that is to put craft in that, exactly. in that, that club as well. Exactly, <laughs> It's going to take some time that you don't, you don't change that we, from a day to another, but, but we'll do it. That's, that's, my, that's my ambition as well, is, uh, to put us in the map and to make people very proud of it. I think this is an unbelievable um, uh, tool, uh, not only for consumers, but, but for, for our internal people as well. But, you know, brings a lot of builds, motivation and pride. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll do yeah, it. I, I <laughs> want to talk more about creativity, but, uh, and I'll get back to that. But, but first, Yoli, I want to ask you. So I didn't, uh, by the way, apologies for that. I didn't announce your, you with your title, um, but I think all viewers registered and now are fully aware that you are the uh, global VP of culture and, uh, and marketing capability at ABI, right? Yes. So there's one thing that struck me about that title is the word marketing. Because I would guess that anything to do with culture would be across all functions. And then anything to do with capability for marketers would definitely involve at least collaboration with other functions. So how, how siloed and that sounds, that's a very leading question, but, uh, but, but <laughs> by lack of better, how, how narrow is your view or how broad are you allowed to go? Then? And, and do you go in your, in your interventions and programs? It's quite broad, actually. Um, you know, marketing is, it's a key priority of our business strategy. Um, that means leading growth by addressing people's needs, right? With brands people love, but that means results, right? So we need to make sure results are impacting not only the short term, but also the long term. We talk a lot about that in the program, obviously. Um, and the role of marketing, you know, as uh, Miguel and I alluded to before, is, is really the role of the super connector, right? We're the gateway to the consumer. Um, so our job is, is to also connect the multiple disciplines within the organization to help them see uh, the future, to help them understand um, who we're creating these products and services for that can help us to grow as a business. And so actually, um, I'm and my team are incredible partners with our sales team, right, from a commercial performance perspective, the supply team, the logistics team, even the legal and corporate affairs team. In fact, I spend a lot of my time um, working with, with that group. And it's really about, you know, how can we um, share and export that same passion for the consumer, the obsession that we have with the consumer and accelerate our programs to make a difference in people's lives. And you know, I think what's really important is that the consumer is, is changing, right? Their needs, their behaviors, especially right now, um, everything is just, you know, just accelerating. And that means that we have to specialize in our capabilities and upskilling our people within marketing differently than perhaps maybe the rest of the organization, right? We've got to be two, three steps ahead. And so we, we do, we work very closely with our people department to leverage, you know, leadership competencies and um, technology systems with our solutions group. Um, but, but we've got to really radiate out and challenge the organization to, to think differently. And, and again, go back to that growth mindset. So my dream, of course, <laughs> would be to, um, you know, to broaden this, but we've got to start somewhere and generate the impact. And, and we're seeing that, right? We've, we've been piloting this for two years um, in the U.S. business, and now we're, we're doing this globally. 
And as a result, we've seen our employee engagement increase significantly in two years. We're seeing the recognition um, from the industry. Um, and we're actually seeing, you know, the collaboration across multiple disciplines that we've never had before, which is, which is really exciting. Great. Oh, nice. Good to hear. Um, well, you, you just, and I said I would come back to that, talked about creativity, a topic very close to my heart. Um, but I'm, I'm most interested in the role of leadership in creativity. And, and um, I know if you read um, the, uh, the book on uh, the biography on, um, on Leonardo da Vinci, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very impressive. And if there's one thing he is known for is his sketchbooks with hundreds and hundreds of drawings from, I don't know, flying tanks to whatever. 99% never made it. So he, he wasn't afraid to fail and, and, and also to share and talk about his, his, the things that, that failed. And I think that's a, that's a real leadership trait. It's how you build a culture in which you reframe failure as, as an opportunity to learn from. And I think in, in many cases, probably one of the biggest blockers in creativity it is shame and, and fear. And, and I think there's a real role for leadership there. Can you talk about that from a very personal point of view? Like, like what's been your stuff? And maybe where have you failed? Well, I failed many <laughs> times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I need more than an hour to talk about the failures as well. Um, I think that maybe the most um, important uh, role of a leader, and the more you are on the top, the more you have to do it, is really to inspire the troops. It's, real, it's really to inspire people to go um, after different things. Um, and, um, and, 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 and part of this inspiration has to be exactly about uh, reducing the shame and, and the fear of doing it. I'll give you an example. I, you know, I was yeah. last week with, uh, in a call with one of our countries and they want to pursue a path on something that I think is, is wrong. Um, but I didn't tell them not to do it. I told them, I, I, I told them go after it, you know, let's conclude about it. Let's, I expect them to conclude either what I think or to make or to change my mind. Um, I think it's, it it's, uh, happens a lot. You kill creativity by saying no. Um, you know, it's, it, you, you solve a problem. When you say no, it, it's, you know, it, it's no longer an option. So you go, you go somewhere else, but you kill absolutely creativity uh, instead of inspiring people to find uh, solutions or to change your mind. I, I always say that I change my mind very often, um, not because I'm insecure, but because I'm, it's the opposite, uh, because I'm open for change all the time. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, uh, to, to talk about creativity, um, you, you really have to inspire your people and whoever is around you. Um, and not only our people with our agencies as well, um, but, uh, and reduce the shame and the fear. Um, and you have to do it in a constant basis. It's, yeah. It's, it's interesting on this topic um, that uh, either you mentioned or to me in, in, in one of our conversations or, or I read it in an interview, I forgot, but you mentioned that, uh, and I think you mentioned last week actually, that, um, that you stopped your innovation projects at this moment in time. Uh, because, because in, in these C19 days, we, we need to focus elsewhere. This is not the time to innovate. This is, this is the time to provide safety and comfort. Yeah. Emotional well-being. Yeah, I, it's, I think that uh, um, what I meant is that in a moment like this, both customers and even consumers. So customers do not want complexity. Um, you know, they have to deal with a huge complexity now in the stores with less people from, from their teams working because they are in quarantine, et cetera, because volumes increase dramatically. 
and, and so they, they want to, to reduce the complexity in the stores. And that means we reduce dramatically the number of SKUs. So for that reason, um, they also do not want innovation and, and, and we neither. It's, it's a moment to concentrate, to increase uh, productivity in our factories and in, 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 in the shelves. Now, that doesn't mean that we do not care or we don't think there's a role for innovation at this moment. I think there's a big, big, well, for, in, for creativity, definitely, yes. This is the moment to be very, very creative. But, but on innovation, um, the difficulties we have right now is, is, is to our R&D teams to, to develop products from their kitchens at home. That's the biggest problem I have right now because they are not in the, in the, in the labs, in the R&D centers, they are at home. Um, so that concerns me about the, the, the midterm. Um, but, um, but the innovation was more a, a situation, you know, we all feel like this COVID has been here for a year, but has only yeah. been for 45 days, right? Yeah. So at, at this moment, uh, we really had to rethink um, uh, the, the pipeline of products, of innovation, portfolio of products, right? And, and so we stopped a lot of innovation for that reason, yeah. to reduce complexity. Yeah. Makes total sense. I'm going to, uh, to go to uh, some of the questions that have been posted. Uh, there's one from um, um, IOG 100 member Carlos Fonseca. He asked it to, to both of you, but Jody, I'm, I'm, I'm handing it to you. Uh, and it's the, the question you've probably been asked most often in the past, what is it, 45 days, uh, as Miguel just said. How consuming behavior change after COVID will impact your business? Drinking and eating uh, are social activities. What insights and strategic adjustments have you done so far? And, and, and can you, can you um, let's say, uh, uh, enlighten uh, Carlos with? Yeah, sure. Um... So I think one thing that's been really interesting is that the consumer behaviors we're seeing now have actually been slowly happening over the past, you know, few years. Um, but it, it really took a, a sense of urgency on our part to, to take a step further and really understand what was going on there. Um, and of course, there's many more new behaviors that are, that are emerging as well. Um, a couple that I can talk about. One is the, is the role of, of, of how people are socializing, sociability. Uh, we're seeing many more, obviously, intimate gatherings. Um, people are meeting one-on-one -on -one versus, obviously, even, even on a Zoom or a house party. You know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the app. <coughs> more intimate, right? Groups of four, groups of five, where they're getting to know each other a little bit better. And um, the level and depth of conversation that they're having is much more intimate and meaningful. And trying to understand the role that we can play in, in bringing people together, albeit at a distance. Um, how can we, how can we, you know, help them with, 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 with that. Um, another is we're seeing uh, a lot in home, obviously around meals and how people are <laughs> funny around with, with Miguel and Kratz. <laughs> um, but the shortcuts and the hacks people are taking to cooking um, and, and gatherings at the, at the dinner table. We were talking even, you know, I, I, I'm, every night at six o'clock, I'm having a family dinner that I haven't had in 25 years. <laughs> um, and it's really wonderful because we're getting to know each other in a different way. And, and we're in food and, and drinks are, are a big piece of that. Um, and then, you know, we're also monitoring very closely what's going to happen in what we call the on-premise or the on-trade, which are bars and restaurants. And so even as, uh, uh, you know, governments and, and cities are, are starting to reopen, people are very hesitant to go back to socialize like they once did, right? And big massive parties and going out and clubbing and, and all of that. And um, we're actually seeing a lot of that behavior being mimicked almost at home. So in China, um, there's a new phenomenon called e-clubbing and um, we're highlighting different DJs and people are gathering and you know, uh, drinking responsibly, actually even more so. So we're seeing smart drinking become a really big um, big, big space for us to continue championing as, as, as in our industry. Um, and we've taken that live streaming idea and we've now scaled it across several of the other markets. Um, in Brazil, we have a brand called Brahma, um, which basically broke the internet a couple weeks ago because of a live streaming event that they hosted by tapping into nostalgic 
um, uh, music artists and, and acts and just giving people a reason to connect um, again. So, but we're constantly okay. learning every day. Let, let me tell you one thing I, I did yesterday. Two things, one related to, related to beverage, another one related to food. So, you know, we are concerned with our employees, not only with the ones that are on the in front lines, but the ones that are at home um, concerned a lot, super concerned about mental health. And, and, and we started, you know, producing uh, content uh, ourselves to our people uh, on many, many different fronts. So, so yesterday I cooked uh, for, for my team. So I had 3,000 people cooking with me. So I was in the kitchen cooking and oh, telling cool. them what I was using. Um, another thing I did at the end of the day was a happy hour with another group. Uh, of, of a group just of leaders and, and having a happy hour with them and I encourage them to have a glass of beer or wine or water um, but without presentations, just conversation uh, and I think that at this moment um, this is absolutely critical to happen in, in companies is, is uh, to, to keep the hand on, on the communication with people people are really appreciating uh, we are also bringing external speakers to talk about different things and so keep them you know um, um, uh, inter entertained working and entertained and, and and have that human touch that i think at this moment is so critical yes. i would even i would I'd add too and i think you're doing this right is the our leadership is becoming much more human right so yes. well yes of course the happy hours but even opening those happy hours and their children running around in the background. And um, it's, it's a completely different view that our colleagues are seeing of our leaders. And it's, it's actually helping to build confidence. It's helping to build more trust and comfort. Yeah. And that, that gives you know, people hope that you know, we can get out of this, which I think is, has been really great. Absolutely. In my kitchen yesterday, I was with my wife, my three daughters, and, and people ask questions to them. And and, and, and now the problem is that now they, they, they want me to send them the recipe of what I cooked, which I will do in the weekend. There's your new cookbook. Uh, my cookbook. But that is, you know, that's so important in a moment like this that the companies become closer to their people that show more and more their human side, right? Yeah. Talk about yeah. human growth. Uh, that's an important topic. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's many more questions coming in than, than we can handle in this hour. There's one that now some, I was going to ask, I was going to say uh, Lars van den Dries, which is my son, <laughs> uh, posted the question he did not, but actually an anonymous attendee did, and, uh, because I'm curious as well. Jody, I'm curious, how's Corona beer handling? Uh, it's less candid but widely popular uh, virus relative. Uh, <laughs> so can you, can you say anything about that? Well, uh, so we don't own Corona in the U.S., uh, but we do own Corona globally. Um, and, you know, the, we're, we're monitoring, obviously, the situation. I think, you know, we haven't seen so much sentiment and mentions <laughs> and social related to the brand. And it's, it's actually not all negative, which has been, I think, a really interesting learning. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, again, it depends on markets where, where it's growing and not. Um, but I can say in Mexico... Uh, corona is is like you know is like our Budweiser in the U.S. Right? Yeah. It's 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 the the home brand, and what the team has been able to do to help society there, between you know the hand sanitizer movements and the masks and our volunteer program and um, I mean the list goes on and on. And most most recently they launched a um, non alcoholic. Um, uh, corona called Corona Gracias, and all the proceeds are going to you know, local communities. Um, so they're really, I think they're really, you know, looking at this oppor I don't say opportunity, but the opportunity to actually connect with people um, in a community in a different way versus I think the old, you know, brand and communications and promotion um, and people are respecting that. Is, is uh, Jaden Carl still uh, leading the Corona brand? He's a former colleague of mine. Uh, no. no. <laughs> no, okay. no. I remember vaguely that he, he, he was involved in the Corona brand. I have a question from, um, uh, from a, a marketeer that I respect a lot. He's the CMO for PepsiCo in, uh, in Russia. 
uh, the, and for the, the, the dairy uh, business. Um, Jan van Twillert, congrats on your successes, uh, Miguel. In what way do you expect creativity to reignite growth at Kraft Heinz? Oh, I, I put it, uh, so after this meeting, I have very important meeting, which I'm sharing strategy for the future with, uh, with the team in the US. Um, and, and creativity is, 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 is one, is a very important pillar of that. You know, we have to build it from scratch, um, but I think it's uh, absolutely doable and, and, and great, and we are going to do it. Um, so it, it plays in one of, one of the pillars for our strategy for the future, no doubt. Um, again, uh, um, it's not rocket science. What I think is important is patience, um, uh, is building capabilities, is, you know, using your words, Frank, to eliminate the shame and the fear of people and to reward them for that. Um, at, uh, at ABI, seven years ago, we did a, a meeting with all leaders of marketing and with our agencies, and I, I brought the CEO. It was a whole week meeting to reflect about why we had so many, so many cool brands uh, you know, Budweiser, Stella Artois, Corona, Miklops, so many amazing brands, but we were terrible on creativity. And we got out of that meeting with four things to do. First, you know, because we didn't, uh, we were afraid of being creative. Our leaders didn't like creativity, right? Our marketing leaders. We, we had to either to promote people from from within or to go to the market to change that. The second one was because they were safe. We had safe agencies. So we had to change agencies. The third was our processes. We were so process oriented as a company that the processes were killing creativity. And the fourth was that we were not rewarding creativity and, and we built a program that we still call Creative X that has been a, a way to reward and stimulate people about being creative. Um, I think that at Kraft Heinz, you know, that, that uh, it, it's not going to be that different. We have this, these four problems as well, and, and, and we'll have to, to fix them and to inspire our, our people and to reduce the shame and the fear and, and to build capabilities and, and to change the processes and reward creativity. I think that, and, and I feel very, I, I just have to, Sometimes to remember that I'm the CEO, not the CMO, but I, that creativity plays very important uh, uh, part on my heart. Probably tough on the CMO to be working under you. But <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. I'll get back to this one. There's one that I want to talk about, uh, also a topic close to my own heart is, um, Jody, like me, you have a consumer uh, insights background. Um, uh, consumer first thinking and being consumer centric or better actually human centric is something I know is very close to your heart. Uh, it's, it's now needed more than ever. I see a lot of industries and, and, and CPG is not really leading this charge logically, uh, digitizing basically the whole business. Um, and these digital transformations I think if they don't have the customer journey as the organizing principle, as the backbone, it's an opportunity missed. It's not to say that they can't be successful, it's just an opportunity missed. I know from our previous conversation that ABI is, is in CPG land is, is pretty much ahead. Kraft Heinz is very early day uh, in, in the digital transformation. I'm really interested in the role of the CMO in that digital transformation. Because in many companies, I see it's a CTO led, sometimes a COO. I spoke this morning with somebody. Um, and that's just, they won't bring that kind of human centricity, human centric lens that, that the chief CMO uh, would or should at least. Can you talk about that? I don't know how close you've been involved with that process in ABI. Uh, been very involved actually. And um, you, okay, you know, great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think one of, one of the, um, the challenges, right, particularly coming from an insights background, is to be able to um, build the DNA 
in someone else who maybe hasn't had that deep appreciation for real human connection and real human insights and understanding those truths and across the journey, right? Across all the different activities one would go through in their day. And, um, and so almost as a shortcut, you resort to, let's say, traditional research, right? The attribute that's on a brand health study um, or a quote that's in a, a, a qual report. They don't get close enough to the consumer, right? And it might be because they're afraid, right? And so it's up to us to try to, um, to break that fear. It might be because they don't quite understand or could find the time to do it. Um, and I think what's been, been helpful with digital is it's actually been able to get us closer to what's happening out there with consumers and the public and society. And um, it's helping us to learn a lot faster. And so there's a huge upside to this, right? So we, in the U.S., we have a, um, uh, a consumer panel of around 6,000 people that we tap into on a daily basis. And it could be from, you know, understanding product innovation to communications or just understanding and mapping out what people go through on a regular, you know, on a daily basis, their journey. Um, but then you couple that with data. So we mentioned working with partners. Our partners are huge in this, right? How do we innovate <coughs> with them to build new capabilities to understand um, that journey, for example? You know, for us, it's, it's, um, it's been a, a few years coming, right? We, we've never owned our own, our own data, right? We're not a DTC company, largely, uh, because of, you know, the three-tier system in the United States. We have wholesalers, et cetera. And so we're learning that data has become a, a huge asset to get closer to, to that consumer. Um, so it's really marrying the, the data-driven approach with empathy. And when a company can do that well, that's powerful. And yeah. I think we've, we've got a few examples of that with some of our brands um, where we've been able to move quite nimbly because we understand the consumer at that level. Frank, if you allow me, I wanted just to compliment what I was saying about creativity before, because I was talking with a marketing, a marketing angle or a marketing point of view, but I think that actually the ultimate goal of a company should, should be to, to, to bring creativity to almost all areas of the company, you know, with the exception of accounting, safety and quality. I think that uh, everybody can be more creative every day. So, um, the idea of efficiency, um, you know, companies that are either efficient or they are creative, that doesn't exist or shouldn't exist. Um, and I, when I look at CPG, I, normally I see companies that are very efficient or they are very creative or they are much more consumer driven. I think that, you know, the big, the big, uh, uh, task for companies in the world is, is to be strong on both. And that's definitely what I want. I want uh, a creative company, uh, but I want an efficient company as well. I admire a lot company like Amazon that can be very strong on both sides. Um, it's very efficient, but it's extremely creative. And, and I don't see this still really happening in consumer goods. Um, and one can feed the other one. And, and uh, you know, that's you know, as a CEO, that, that is the company that I want to build, a company that mm -hmm. is both very strong on both sides of the brain, not, not only on one side. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Miguel. I'm currently writing together with my co-founder, Mark uh, the Swan Ahrens, and Greg Welch, who leads the CMO practice for Spencer Stewart, an article on what we call the Da Vinci Growth CMO that, that basically encompasses two parts. One is the whole brain, but also the humanistic uh, part. And, and actually, so when I was going through all these experiences and, and attitudes that such a Da Vinci growth CMO has, I was thinking, so if you have somebody like that, that's somebody you would really like in the driver's seat, or at least next to the driver's seat, for example, in a digital transformation uh, that I know uh, Kraft Heinz is a star that, that you mentioned you're basically at this first stage of. Um, then some companies, and I, I know you, you've worked a long time ago at, at Coke, for example. In Coke, we've seen interesting uh, pivots from basically appointing a CGO, a chief growth officer, about a CMO, and then, then coming back. How do you see that whole discussion, CMO, CGO, 
I mean, you're now in a, you were a CMO, you're now the CEO. How do you view the growth responsibility for CMO? And do you, could you see it making sense that you actually appoint a CGO above a CMO? No, I, I think that, well, I have a CGO, I call it CGO. Um, I think it's, uh, it, at least in my mind, the CGO is, uh, it's, it's the evolution of a CMO. Uh, I mean, it's to make clear that um, growth n uh, needs to be led for sure by the CEO, but with the right hand, that is the person from marketing, with the marketing background in a company that, that should understand the future, should predict the future better than anybody else and should be leading what that means and the consequences of that with consumers, with every, everything else. So, so really has a big component on strategy. I see companies that they have marketing and then they have strategy. <laughs> that doesn't mean, that has no meaning for me. When I see companies that have a head of strategy or a head of marketing or strategies in finance, right? Or somewhere else, then it's like, you know, marketing is just communication or marketing has a weaker role in that company. So for me, when, when you say CGO, or at least in my mind, is making clear to the company inside and out that we are seeking growth and that this person is helping me defining the strategy uh, to get there and trying to understand what is the future and, and, and bringing and helping me a CEO to, 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 to guide us uh, to the future. Um, that's, that's how I see it. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it, it's interesting, Jody, from a, um, and, and I mentioned the, the marketing in your title, um, but, uh, and you said you look definitely beyond marketing. Um, and you look at functional integration, which I think is CGO. I remember that I read somewhere that Nike uh, basically, even at board level, I believe, or at very senior level, people rotate jobs across functions every couple of years just to put them out of the comfort zone, just to make them, you know, think, de de develop the horizontal in their T-shape, if you will. Um, is that, is that a, a philosophy that you also try to, uh, to embrace? I would say more than try to embrace, it's part of our culture, right? So um, yeah. we, we develop certain skills with individuals, and then we export those skills, particularly in a very lean organization, um, so that, yes, there's a bit of general management that we're building, right, to have uh, the wherewithal to, to operate in different capacities, but also there's, to the T-shape, right, there, there is that deep level of expertise that we also protect, and um, so it's, it's not uncommon that you would see somebody in the finance team um, doing a stint in marketing for two to three years and vice versa. Good, good, great. Um, again, um, we're getting so many questions, uh, actually real good questions, some of them. Uh, one that's uh, actually from Dao, who raised his hand at the beginning. And uh, he says, thank you for sharing your perspective. Knowing what you know, what will you do different to pre be prepared or ready for a next crisis? I think that's a very good question. What do we learn in in being prepared for a crisis. Um, Miguel, any, any thoughts come to mind for you? Look, what, um, at, at Kraft Heinz, one thing that I, when I, when I arrived and was about a year ago, that uh, um, didn't make sense was the fact that uh, ownership and people were, were proud of the concept of ownership and, and accountability that this was not coming with agility. I think that one of the big advantages of a, a company that has, that, is a, that has a sense of accountability. So people, you know, less layers, it's leaner, not leaner to, to reduce costs, but to make people more accountable. Um, and with, with a very clear KPIs to deliver and objectives, um, the company should be agile and, and, and for me, that was not happening. We were behind on everything. Um, and at this moment, you know, I'm, I, you know, then I saw at this moment how agile we became. So this sense of ownership, the pride 
the sense of duty, responsibility to feed the world literally um, made us communicate much faster and, and, being, and, and making decisions must much faster and, and being uh, much more agile. So, I, I, and I'm saying, I'm, I'm telling this story because I think that uh, uh, for, in crisis, agility is, is everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. The speed of uh, change that we had in these last five weeks or six weeks or eight weeks has been brutal. And, and I think that companies that uh, take too much time, that are too hierarchical, um, they lose. You know, so, so, so I think this is a big learning um, for us and, 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 and for everybody that is watching us. Um, yeah. It's in moments of crisis, agility, decision making, is critical and crucial. Um, yeah, that would be my yeah. five cents. I, think, of... uh, I, I see Javier Mesa, um, who, who um, is the CMO at uh, Coca-Cola for the sparkling business. He, he posts basically a thought that, that I couldn't agree more with, which is that uh, organization structures is less about the structure. It's more about the culture and the, uh, and the processes. Um, the way I would say it is, let's say the um, let's say the, the the guiding principles are more important than the the cells in the racy charts, and, and and especially in these days, it you need to know. Hopefully, those guiding principles are aligned with what the purpose of the company is, and that gives that gives direction and gives people the freedom to move fast. Mm -hmm. um, I see you nodding, Miguel. Jody, um, is that, I mean, do you have such guiding principles? Like I know one company I know said one of the guiding principles is, uh, you know, I'd rather have you ask forgiveness than permission, which is a, a, a guiding principle that's all about empowerment and there's more such. Do you have such, do you have these kinds of mantras or guiding principles? We, we, we absolutely do. Um, at AB InBev, it's called Dream People Culture. And there, so it is our know, culture. It's... Dream People Culture. Right? It's, yeah. it's our, the principles by which we live by as a company and, and in times of crisis in particular. And, uh, you know, there's a whole spectrum of those. When you tap back into who you are, who you fundamentally are, your, your purpose as a company and your principles of how you operate, um, you see the strength, right, in, in that. And um, one, one thing I did want to just compliment Miguel's comment on, and this also goes to the principles of our company, is, is collaboration, right? So it's the speed and agility with which we can work, but it's also collaboration. And uh, our, our company is unique in that we are a big global CPG organization, but we really operate at the local levels, uh, internally and externally with our communities and you know, our partners. And never before, have we seen local and global working together in concert happily <laughs> yeah. um, to achieve, you know, amazing programs at the speed of light and even sharing those best practices. I think one of the, one of the positive, um, you know, silver linings coming out of this is, is the best practices that we're generating. And again, it's not like case studies written on a, on a, on a PowerPoint presentation. It's, it's shared learnings to keep us well, going. It's, it's, uh, it's very much what we've been doing now in, in the past hour. And I, I really want to thank you for being open, uh, for uh, taking all the questions um, and, and just for, for sharing you know, what you learned and, uh, and also being honest about the, uh, the challenges you still see ahead. It was a really special hour. I really regret the hour is already gone because I have like dozens of questions more as had the uh, viewers. Um, so I uh, just want to close with saying that uh, next week, uh, same time, same place, my uh, co-founder, Mark de Swan Arons, is uh, speaking with Michael Diamond, professor at, uh, marketing professor at NYU and uh, important contributor to the IRG. And for all the viewers, um, everything, please visit our website, Institute for Real Growth, where you can view the recording or share it, share a link to, uh, to colleagues or friends, wherever you feel uh, need. And um, yeah, again, uh, Miguel, Jody, I think it was a fantastic hour. I want to thank you 
also on behalf of all the viewers. And um, I wish you a fantastic weekend. You too. See you Thank next you. week, everybody. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.